Good evening, all. I welcome you all to the most very important uh, subject uh, which we are today taking up. That is uh, the importance of sociology in the development as a discipline. How sociology is important. So for that, this is the 461st session of our forum, as you all know. For that, we have requested Dr. Rajya Lakshmi from uh, Delhi University. She is uh, amongst us now. And uh, I all, I request uh, Dr. Pre uh, James Prashant to do a formal introduction and later Dr. Akhtota Srinivaslu will moderate this session. Madam will speak about, for about uh, 45 minutes to one hour. Then we'll have a Q&A. I request, since all of you are muted, uh, I request all of you, whoever has a question after the, after the talk, I request you to raise your hands, then I'll uh, allow you to ask a question, please. Thank you so much. James, can you do the introduction, please? A very good evening to everyone. A warm welcome for the 461st forum session of Telangana Jana Vedika on this Sunday. Our topic today is development of sociology as a discipline. Sociology is the study of human social life. Sociology has many subsections of study ranging from the analysis of conversations to the development of theories to try to understand how the entire world works. It is important to understand why sociology is important and how it can change the perspective of the world around you. Sociology has its roots in the industrial revolution, world empires, and the development of natural scientists, that is the age of enlightenment. When <clears throat> mid 19th century Europe moved towards an industrial economy from an agricultural economy, it led to a large number of new kinds of occupations. There was a massive migration to urban areas and cities due to, due to uh, search, search and search of employment. Old familial and generational ties were broken. Their way of life since generations ended abruptly. People could lead discreet lives. However, people ended up in terrible working as well as in living conditions. There was filth and massive poverty. Now, people in these urban areas began to develop new ideas of human rights, civil rights, liberty, and democracy. These ideals led to political revolution. Due to imperialism slash colonialism, Europeans saw cultures drastically different from themselves and questioned why they were so. Then the age of enlightenment and the development of natural sciences made people to question the fundamental aspects of the social world. Professor Ryan, Deborah, and Piotr say, sociology is a branch of the social sciences that uses systematic methods of observation, objectivity, empirical investigation, and critical analysis to develop and refine a body of knowledge about human behavior, social structure, and activity, sometimes with the goal of applying such knowledge to, the benefit, the general, to benefit the general social welfare. Sociology is a broad discipline in terms of methodology and subject matter. Its traditional focuses have included social relations, social stratification, social interaction, culture, and deviance. And its approaches have included both qualitative and quantitative research techniques. As much of what humans do fits under the category of social structure or social activity. <clears throat> sociology has gradually expanded its focus to such far-flung subjects as the study of economic activity, health disparities, and even the role of social activity in the creation of scientific knowledge. An important factor to remember is that society does not remain unchanged over time. And early practitioners developed the discipline as an attempt to understand societal changes. Marx, Weber, and Durkheim were disturbed by the social processes they believe to be driving the change. And some examples are the quest for solidarity, the attainment of social goals, and the rise and fall of classes. The early sociologists employed what C. Wright Mills labeled as the sociological imagination, which is the ability to situate personal troubles within an informed 
in that framework of social issues. And he proposed that what people need is a quality of mind that will help them to use information and to develop reason in order to achieve lucid summations of what is going on in the world and of what may be happening within themselves. The sociological imagination enables its possessor to understand the larger historical scene in terms of its meaning for the inner life and the external career of a variety of individuals. This helps people to step out of their personal self-centric world and into the sociological imagination where people are able to see the events and social structures that influence their behavior, culture, and attitudes. Humans usually attempt to understand the social world, causes, and attempts without employing the scientific methods. This is why humans and societies have used religious ceremonies for centuries to invoke the will of gods because they believed the gods control certain elements of the natural world, which would be an attempt to influence the natural world without first understanding how it works. Sociologists, in order to test their theories, enter the social world, which is induction. Evaluation of their theories in light of the data that has been gathered is deduction. Peter Berger says, what distinguishes the sociologist from non-scientific researchers is that the sociologist tries to see what is there. He may have hopes or fears concerning what he may find, but he will try to see regardless of his hopes or fears. It is thus an act of pure perception. Sociology is then an attempt to understand the social world by situating social events in their or responding environment, that is social structure, culture, history, and trying to understand social phenomena by collecting and analyzing empirical data. To talk on this most important field of study of our times, we have Dr. Vasaraju Raji Lakshmi, and we are extremely happy to have her delivered on this topic to us this evening. Professor Raj Lakshmi is a BA Honours Sociology, University Miranda House, uh, New Delhi. Uh, she has done her MA Sociology, MPhil Sociology from uh, JNU New Delhi, and also her PhD in Sociology from JNU New Delhi. She has around 29 years of teaching experience and is currently teaching as an Associate Professor in the Department of Sociology, Janki Devi Memorial College, Delhi University. She has vast experience in diverse fields of study and has worked for organizations like IWST, ISI, CSR, STOP, Pragna Research Consultancy Services. She has published two books and 10 research papers in international and national journals. She did her postdoctoral research on language as a symbol of ethnic identity, a study of Mulki movement in the Telangana districts of Andhra Pradesh. She has been a consultant to Delhi government in the women's empowerment cell. During this, she started a campaign, Awaz at all, raise your voice. Additionally, she has been a subject expert for sociology with NIOS since 2016, contributed to e-content development for senior secondary grades, regular panelists for Rajya Sabha TV, conducts regular workshops for gender sentiment sensitization with the Delhi police. We are most honored to have uh, Professor Vasaraju Rajalakshmi in our midst. Now, before I hand over the floor to our moderator, as per our tradition at TJV, I would like to read the preamble of our constitution. We, the people of India, having solemnly resolved to constitute India into a sovereign social secular republic and to secure to all its citizens justice, social, economic, and political, liberty of thought, expression, belief, faith, and worship, equality of status and of opportunity, and to promote among them all fraternity, assuring the dignity of the individual and the unity and integrity of the nation. In our Constituent Assembly, this 26th day of November, 1949, do hereby adopt, enact, and give to ourselves this Constitution. Thank you. Now, uh, Professor Srinivaskar. Thank you. Thank you, James. Sir, you know what? Thank you, James. Yeah, Thank you. You're audible. You're, you're yeah. audible. Thank you. Telangana Jana Vedika Zoom online meeting which is not 20. Uh, Professor uh, Vasaraj Rajalak Pigarki Vedika Sabdilu Adarki Sayankala Namaskar Al Telegis 2. 
స్వాగతం సుస్వాగతం ఇవాళ నియానికి కూడా చాలా ఒక ప్రత్యేకమైనటువంటి అంశాన్ని మనం ఎన్నుకున్నాం ఎందుకంటే సామాజిక శాస్త్రాలను ఇవాళ మర్చిపోతున్నటువంటి ఈ క్రమం లోపల సోషల్ సైన్సెస్ ఉండేటువంటి పర్టికులర్లీ సోషాలజీకి ఉండేటువంటి ఇంపార్టెంట్ ఏంటి అనేటువంటి విషయం మీద మనం ఇవాటి ఆ కార్యక్రమంలో చర్చించుకోబోతున్నాం ప్రధానంగా విజ్ఞానం అంతా మొదటిగా ఒకటిగానే ఉండేది అధ్యయన సౌలభ్యం కోసం విజ్ఞానాన్ని మూడు భాగాలుగా విభజించడం అనేటువంటి జరిగింది అందులో జీవశాస్త్రాలు అంటే జీవం ఉన్నటువంటి మొక్కల గురించి కానీ జంతువుల గురించి కానీ డిస్కస్ చేసేటువంటి జీవశాస్త్రాలు రెండోది భౌతిక శాస్త్రాలు ముఖ్యంగా రసాయనాలు కావచ్చు పదార్థాల గురించి అధ్యయనం చేసేటువంటి శాస్త్రాలు ఇక మూడో శాస్త్రాలు అయినటువంటివి సోషల్ సైన్సెస్ వాటినే సామాజిక శాస్త్రాలు అనేటువంటి పేర్కొని మీద మనం తెలుసుకున్నాం దాంట్లో పబ్లిక్ అడ్మినిస్ట్రేషన్ కావచ్చు పొలిటికల్ సైన్స్ కానీ ఎకనామిక్స్ కానీ హిస్టరీ కానీ సోషాలజీ కానీ ఇవన్నీ కూడా మనం సోషల్ సైన్సెస్ గా పిలువడం అనేటువంటి జరుగుతుంది అయితే ప్రధానంగా ముఖ్యంగా నైన్టీన్ నైన్టీ వన్ తర్వాత ఈ దేశం లోపల ముఖ్యంగా భారతదేశం లోపల పర్టికులర్ గా తెలంగాణ ఆంధ్రప్రదేశ్ ఉమ్మడి ఆంధ్రప్రదేశ్ లోపల యొక్క సోషల్ సైన్సెస్ ని అన్నిటినీ కూడా తీసేసేటువంటి ఒక కార్యక్రమం పెద్ద ఎత్తున నాటి ప్రభుత్వాలు మొదలు పెట్టాయి కానీ డెవలప్డ్ కంట్రీస్ అయినటువంటి అమెరికా లాంటి దేశాల లోపల వాళ్ళ సోషల్ సైన్సెస్ యొక్క ఇంపార్టెన్స్ అనేటువంటిది రోజు రోజుకు పెరిగిపోతుంది ఎందుకంటే సోషల్ సైన్సెస్ అనేటువంటివి మనిషి యొక్క పురోగతి గురించి మానవుని యొక్క అభివృద్ధి గురించి సమాజం గురించి సంఘాల గురించి పెళ్లి గురించి కుటుంబ వ్యవస్థ గురించి వివాహం గురించి సంఘాల గురించి రాజకీయాల గురించి వీటన్నిటి గురించి మానవ ప్రవర్తన సాధి గురించి చర్చించేటువంటి శాస్త్రమే యొక్క సామాజిక శాస్త్రాలు అయితే సమాజం ఎట్లా నడవాలి ఏ విధంగా ఉండాలి నీతి నియమాలు ఏ రకంగా ఉండాలనేటువంటిది బోధించేటువంటి శాస్త్రమే ఈ యొక్క సామాజిక శాస్త్రాలు కానీ వాటిని ఇవాళ మొత్తానికి మొత్తంగా తీసేసేటువంటి ప్రయత్నము ఇవాళ ప్రపంచ వ్యాప్తంగా ముఖ్యంగా భారతదేశంలో కూడా కొనసాగు ఈ సమయం లోపల మళ్ళీ మనము ఇవాళ సామాజిక శాస్త్రాల యొక్క ఇంపార్టెన్స్ గురించి మనం చర్చించుకోవడం అనేటువంటిది చాలా ఆ గొప్పగా మనం చెప్పుకోవడానికి అవకాశాలనే అంటే మళ్ళీ కూడా ఇప్పుడు సామాజిక శాస్త్రాల యొక్క పురోగతి అనేటువంటిది మళ్ళీ వస్తుంది వాటి యొక్క పునఃస్థానం అనేటువంటిది సోషల్ సైన్స్ కట్టుకునేటువంటి పునః స్థానం అనేటువంటిది కలుగుతుందని భావిస్తూ ఇవాళ ఆ ప్రత్యేక అధ్యయన విభాగంగా సామాజిక శాస్త్రపు ఎదుగుదల అనేటువంటి అంశం పైన ఆ ప్రొఫెసర్ వాసిరాజు రాజలక్ష్మి గారు వీరు ఆ ఢిల్లీ యూనివర్సిటీలో ప్రస్తుతం అసోసియేట్ ప్రొఫెసర్ గా పనిచేస్తున్నారు వీరు అనేకమైనటువంటి ఆర్టికల్ నేషనల్ ఇంటర్నేషనల్ స్థాయి లోపల ఆర్టికల్స్ రాశారు వివిధ అనేకమైనటువంటి సంస్థల్లో కూడా వీరు అడ్వైజర్ గా కూడా పనిచేస్తున్నారు వీరిని ఈ యొక్క ప్రత్యేక అధ్యయన విభాగంగా సామాజిక శాస్త్ర ఎదుగుదల అనేటువంటి అంశం మీద మాట్లాడవలసిందిగా ప్రొఫెసర్ వాసిరాజు రాజలక్ష్మి గారిని స్వాగతంగా వారిని ఆహ్వానిస్తున్నారు ప్రొఫెసర్ మేడం Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, first of all, I must thank Mr. James and uh, also for giving such a nice, elaborate introduction of mine. Thank you so much. Now, uh, what Mr. James said and the way he introduced and he talked about the subject of sociology, three things are very important. A, he talked about the relevance. He said that in contemporary times, sociology plays a very, very important role. Two, i think if i uh, heard correctly and all he talked about the contributions of various sociologists especially the founding fathers where he took the name of karl marx max weber and durkheim and the third thing which he said was that sociology can be considered as a queen of all social sciences because it has got a special privilege as it includes all other uh, social sciences within itself in the sense that it is very very closely related to other all other social sciences and also uh, he also said that sociology can be a science because it can uh, be studied very systematically and there can be both uh, qualitative and quantitative methods to be used to collect the data and uh, the other thing telugu lo meer cheparu chala clear ga ki as society becomes more and more complex the relevance of sociology increases so i'll take all these points together and then maybe very briefly talk about the fact that yes sociology is very very in, important in contemporary times mainly because our society is becoming very very complex when i say society what do we mean by society 
Society is something which is made up of you and me, that is I and you, us. So what is sociology? Sociology is the study of social relations. It's a, it studies the web of social relationships, which means that it tries to understand that why groups have been formed, who forms the group, what is the impact of the groups, what are the impacts of the institutions which are present in the society, why do we behave in a particular manner, why do we act in a particular manner, what is the impact of that. So this is what is sociology. So therefore, as society becomes more and more complex, when I say complex, means where there is more and more interaction, more and more uh, you know, natural processes taking place, then the relevance of sociology increases. When I started studying sociology way back in 1985, the first question which people ask, what is there to study in society? What is, I said, what is society? I said, society is, you know, you and me. And I said, what is there to study? I said, there is a huge things to study, many, many aspects to study the society. And then as I started studying, I realized that it's really a wide subject. So what I'll do is that I will obviously not be able to cover the wide spectrum of topics, theories, perspectives, which are a part of sociology. To begin with, I'll just say that the birth of sociology is not accident. It was not born just like that. It was born because of the social conditions because of the changes which took place. And that would really help us to understand that why sociology is relevant today. Say for example, after, after COVID, the way we are now learning from each other through digital media, which was never thought of before, and the impact of the digital media in our lives. So that's the way it goes. So society becomes more things are introduced, more aspects emerge for, to, for us to study. So today I'll start with by saying the fact or rather elaborate a little bit about A, that how that the birth of sociology was not accident to the contribution of the uh, earlier thinkers in developing sociology for what it is today. So I'll start begin by these two points. Now, uh, if you look at it, the official birth of sociology that the term sociology was coined somewhere around 1830s. Take a pause and think about why 1830 is important. 1830 is important is mainly because it was a beginning of industrial revolution or rather there were many, many changes which were taking place in the history of the world. If you look at industrial revolution, what did it bring about? It brought about changes in the way in which the production was carried out. That is man, was replaced by machine. The way which, which man was doing agriculture or working with his hands, skills, etc., now became machine made, that is, uh, machines came up. With the machines coming up, uh, there was unemployment, I, you know, unemployment in the sense that the machine could produce more by employing less people. So there was unemployment. Unemployment led to poverty. One of the reasons of poverty was unemployment. And all these things brought about tremendous changes in the society. That is the way in which people related to one another, poverty, unemployment, chaos, migration. That is when, you know, people, when they thought that they could earn more in an in industrial setup, they shifted from villages to industries. As a result, there was a huge migration the villages or you can say the uh, rural areas where agriculture was predominant, people were shifting towards industrial areas. So migration, all these things led to a kind of a chaos, which, which some sociologists or you can say some theorists, thinkers came forward and said that it is important for us to understand that what is the cause of all these things and what will be the impact of all these changes, all these changes. So therefore, the need to study the society emerged. Because there were many, many uh, disturbances, there were many changes, the need was felt to study the society. And it is here 
that one of the founding fathers of sociology by the name of August Com, he's also referred to the father of sociology, came and defined, or rather you can say, coined the term sociology. And before that, the term which was used was industries or industrial setup, industrial sociology or industrial aspects. But it was August Com who coined the term and sociology is made up of two words. So, so society, social or logos, which means the society study of the society at a higher level. So therefore it really focuses on the scientific and the systematic study of society. What August Combe said was that the laws which are there in the natural sciences, the similar kind of laws we should apply to study the society. And one of the laws is to study the cause and effect relationship. That is why a particular thing happens and what is the impact of this. For example, why Corona happened and what is the impact of that? The economic, the impact is wide. It is not just economic, uh, you know, impact, economic, social, cultural, political impacts. So it is a very, very wide aspect. So therefore he said that there are laws, the way we have laws in natural sciences, say, for example, if you, put, you know, uh, throw something up, it comes down like that. So similarly, you know, in society also, he said that, you know, society can be also studied by applying certain laws. And one of the laws is that society is not static, it is dynamic. And he said that every aspect has got both static and dynamic aspect. Static, something which remains st stationed, and then why and what impact does it have and how it moves forward. Say, for example, a child is born, then how the child grows, what happens to the child when he grows and what, you know, how he uh, then matures, understands and then. So that these are the ways in which systematically he advocated for the study of social reality, static and dynamic. So dynamic is that, that no, as Mr. James also introduced by saying that society is never static. It is dynamic, it changes and it continuously keeps changing. And the Im implications of this change has got multiple dimensions to it, multiple aspects to it. And the other very important aspect which he developed was that man moves towards rationality, logic. That is, there is an intellectual development of mankind. He says, as man interacts, there is more and more interaction. There's more and more, um, you know, theories, concepts, reality emerging, and that reality, he says, helps man to move forward. So, you know, there is an intellectual development of mankind. Man moves from one stage to another stage to the third stage, which means that he moves towards rationality, logic. Why? Why first, suppose, I mean, a very simple example. Uh, why certain you know, areas do not have rainfall? Uh, mainly because of the climatical conditions, maybe the weather. Then he moves forward to say that, yes, these are the reasons for it. And then that goes a little further and says that this reason, these are the reasons and it will have this kind of an impact. So that it helps the others to make policies and programs to ensure that the man does not suffer. So, you know, you move towards rationality, logic. For everything, what you do is you go step by step. And you try to move towards understanding it more rationally logic. Of course, this is very important. We are studying human beings. So what may be rational may be irrational to you. But at the same time, even if it's something which is illogical to you or to someone else, you try to find the cause and effect relationship of that. Saying that why and how. So one is should be able to uh, be able to reason out and to understand why and how and what impact does it have. And another very important thing is that sociology never gives solutions. It never gives you an answer to a question in terms of as an closed end. It lives us to understand, analyze it, the other aspects of it. It gives us questions for which we look for answers and then it gives raises more questions and for more answers. A better systematic understanding. 
Why? At the end of the day, we all are studying human beings and no two human beings can think and act alike, except that yes, we can systematically analyze and understand the cause and effect relationship. So this is how uh, August Kumt really uh, tried developing the subject matter. And around the same time, another thinker, Herbert Spencer, said that the best way to study or one of the ways to study the society is to compare society to a living organism. And he also came up with the theory of survival of the fittest. Now, society and living organism, the comparison between the two. Now, uh, society, the living organism is divided into various parts. We have head, we have legs, we have hands, we have, you know, uh, the stomach. I mean, there are different parts of it. Similarly, the society has got different institutions. The various parts of the society are different institutions, like economic institutions, political institutions, cultural institutions, social institutions, religious institutions. So the way in which the uh, living organisms get body parts, and for example, our hand, it helps us to pick up things. It helps us to hold things. Similarly, the various institutions of the society, such as the economic institution, helps us to understand the process of production, consumption, and distribution. The political, ins the political institutions help us to understand the laws, the politics, the uh, order in the society. The way, the way in which, uh, the way in which, sorry, there is, Sorry, there is a slight problem. I can, can I just make a minute? There is some problem with the electricity connection. Just one second. No problem. No problem. Just one second. Just a second, please. No problem. Take your time. Can I continue? Uh, yes. yes yeah. So, uh, so the the way like the various institutions perform different roles. A independent roles. That is, uh, for example, the economic institution provides or coordinates between the production, distribution, and consumption. Similarly, what happens is the, the way the body parts may each part performs a function, A, independent, two, in relation to the other. For example, if I say that the hand helps me to pick up and hold things, it also receives the instructions from the brain, that is the, uh, you know, your uh, brain, and then picks up the things. Two, it helps you to have a balance of your body. It helps you to have a balance of the body. So similarly, uh, the institutions, say, for example, the economic institutions, for its production, it requires labor. And where does the labor come from? It comes from the social institutions. That is the family. So uh, that is why in society, it is very, very important that the individual should be born or connected to a stable family. So therefore, what happens is the labor. The labor for the economic institution comes from the society. So Herbert Spencer said that the best way to understand and study the society, the subject matter of sociology, is to compare a society to a living organism. The way an in a child is born, then grows, matures, then dies. Similarly, the society has certain aspects which are introduced, born, if they grow, they mature, and not death, but decay. That is, then they are replaced by other aspects. The social, social reality, when it reaches a particular point, which reaches a particular stage, then it always tries to cope up with the other aspects so that it is able to survive or 
see it in a different light. So this is how Albert Spencer has contributed to the understanding of sociology as a subject matter. He also introduced the theory of survival of the fittest, where he said that individuals forever are trying to cope up in order to be a part of the society, it's part of the society. And all those who are able to cope up are able to you know, relate themselves to the nature and to the social reality around them are able to move forward. And from here onwards, we have uh, the founding fathers of sociology who took up this subject as a scientific discipline and studied more systematically, as studied more systematically. Yeah, yeah. Come now, wait, wait a minute. There's a power outage in Delhi. Madam got disconnected. She'll join in another minute, please. Please wait. She joined, and she will be here in a Madam, unmute yourself, please. Yeah, I'm sorry. There's some problem with the connection today. Extremely sorry. No problem. Oh, I'm feeling so embarrassed. Okay, uh, can I continue? No, no. Please, 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 ma please, please. Ma yeah. uh, so, Herbert Spencer, now, as I said in the beginning of my lecture or my talk, that is uh, the uh, birth of sociology is not an accident, but one of the causes or one of the reason was industrial revolution. When I say revolution, it means drastic changes. Now, around the same time, there were other uh, lot of uh, things which happened. There was French Revolution, which, um, which 
uh, taught people to think about themselves as citizens and the main slogan of for, for the people, by the people, to the people and all these things emerged where people started looking at themselves and they started coming forward to, uh, for, uh, to vote, to voice out their opinions for the formation of a state or a country. So there was this French Revolution, which, of course, politically brought about many, many changes, uh, which had a direct implication on the social uh, aspects as well. So Industrial Revolution, French Revolution, and then the Scientific Revolution. That is, the science and technology also started you know, uh, progressing. That is, more and more scientific inventions took place. And one of the things was, of course, the control of death rate. And as a result of control of the death rate, though they were scared, birth rate was not controlled for a little while. You know, I won't go into the detail about all that uh, aspects of population growth and aspects. But uh, what was important for us to understand is that there was an imbalance between the birth rate and the growth rate, which resulted to population exposure or which resulted in the growth of population. So, uh, and so therefore, scientific inventions, sci medical facilities, all these also brought about a lot of changes in the society. And therefore, there was a need to study the changes which led to the growth or the birth of, not growth exactly, but the birth of sociology, which over a period of time grew in a very, very systematic and a useful science. Useful science, why I say useful sciences, mainly because uh, it is important for us at all times to understand that why a particular thing happens and why we get affected. That is, who are we? We are a part of the society. What, fine. So society is made up of individuals. The moment I start looking at myself as me and not as I, I is a biological self, that is, I'm born. But the moment I start looking around myself, I become a social being. So therefore, from the time when I'm born, my socialization process, the way I interact with my uh, you know, siblings, my parents, my neighbors, that is the time when we, I start interacting with the society. And then it becomes very, very useful for me to understand myself as an individual who is a part of a society. So therefore, sociology is a very, very important social science. Why do we, we say science? We say it is a social science mainly because it studies the society. And how do we look at this as a science? It is a systematic study. Science, we see here as systematic. It observes, it anal analyzes, but yes, it cannot be experimented. That's not a part of it. And that is why it is different from natural sciences. Obviously, uh, in order to understand the impact of drug addicts on, on an individual, the impact of drugs on individuals, one cannot become a drug addict. So there are certain limitations where you cannot uh, be an, you know, a part of it and then study. Of course, as an outsider, you study. So therefore, there are many, many statistical tools which help us to understand and analyze our society and study society. Uh, so this is how the, uh, you know, the birth or rather there were a few uh, reasons for the emergence of sociology around the same time, around the same time, uh, many sociologists came forward and felt the need to study, as Mr. James mentioned earlier, Karl Marx. Now, Karl Marx is not actually referred to as a sociologist in the true sense by many because he never talked about the relationship between individual and society. But his understanding of social relations, that is the system which directly impacted the individuals in the society is very, very important. And that is why as a student of sociology, we always study him. We study the way he studied the capitalistic society. He studied the impact of capitalism, which was the result of industrial growth and how capitalism in affected and how it would affect, he predicted the impact of capitalism. 
So I'll very briefly talk about Karl Marx here. Now, Karl Marx uh, says that, you know, uh, society is fundamentally uh, is divided into two structures or, uh, you know, one way of understanding is that you study that society has got two structures, the infrastructure and the superstructure. When I say infrastructure, it means the base, the foundation of a society or of a base that is an and the other is the superstructure that is which is above the infrastructure, which is dependent on the infrastructure or is related to infrastructure. And it is this infrastructure, he says, is, is consists or it consists of the economic base, the economic aspect. The infrastructure, the foundation of any society is its economic aspect. So he talks about the base of any society as economic base. And therefore, he says that this economic base, that is infrastructure, basically has two classes. That is it's divided into two classes, or it has got, it consists, it consists of two classes. That is those who own the means of production and those who do not own the means of production. And when did Marx start writing? He started writing when there was industrial revolution, when there was a trade increase in trade and commerce, why mainly because industrial, we go a little before, industrial revolution led to the growth of production. It increased the production. And when the production increased, it became essential for the states, for the countries to trade with the others so that they could increase the profit, so that they could, you know, have the wealth. And it is around this time that Karl Marx started right, uh, you know, uh, analyzing and understanding the impact of industrial growth, which is one of the growth, one way of industrial growth he saw was the rise of capitalism. So Karl Marx was interested in understanding that why capitalism emerged and how it would grow and what would be the impact of that. And so therefore, it's important for us to understand the way he analyzed and the way he understood the society. And that is why I said the society, he basically tried understanding by saying the society is divided into two structures, the infrastructure and the superstructure. Uh, if anybody has any questions, they can ask, raise their hands or otherwise I'll continue. Please continue. Man. They'll continue. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so... Uh, and the, so therefore, what he said was that the uh, infrastructure consists of two classes, that is those who own the means of production and those who do not own the means of production. It is the relationship which is of conflict, which actually essentially explains the social change in the society. Now, this is how he also explains that how society changes. That is, he says the society changes whenever there is a clash or a conflict between the means of production and the relations of production. Say, for example, if land is one means and the relationship with land is one of wages. So if there is a conflict between the land and the wages, there will be a change. There will be a conflict and there will be a change. So the change would be whenever there is a clash between the means and the relationships. That is, for example, in, if you have to understand in today's world and today's way, if I don't get proper wages or if I don't get proper rent for the house in which I am, you know, which I'm uh, giving it to someone, renting it out, it does not pay me good rent. I always remove it, change it. And there will be a change. I'll have a new one. So this is a very simplistic way of understanding that the relationship between the owner and the non-owner is one of rent, one of wages, one of ownership and non-ownership. And what he says is that the class, class is very, very important. And the class is defined in economic terms and economic terms. And what is very important is not the income and the occupation, but what is important is the way in which you're related to the means of production that is either as an owner or a non-owner. So what he said was that because of industrial revolution, there was a, a lot of industry, you know, a lot of production. 
and the capitalists who owned the industries who owned the means of production their main aim was to maximize profit so one of the things is that when they saw huge production had been happening with the help of the machines what they did was they started you know thinking and their main aim was to maximize profit so therefore in order to maximize profit they adopted a kind of an attitude which the workers later he says would come together and realize and understand that they are exploited and this exploitation he explained by the theory of surplus value which is very very important for all of us to read and understand i won't go into the detail it's only very simply it says that the value which is generated over and above for what a worker is paid so therefore what marx talked about was that the people because of the impact of the capitalistic growth capitalism capitalism there will be a consciousness developed by those who do not own the means of production and this would happen mainly because the capitalists are interested and only aim to maximize profit so in order to maximize profit they would give less wages to the workers and will think about less investing in the workers the non owners so therefore the non owners would feel exploited would develop a consciousness and they will all come together in a conflict with the owners so he talked about the uh, the growth of capitalism leading to monopolization leading to polarization where the classes would polarize and drift apart and then there would be a revolution however whatever marx predicted never happened because there was a growth of the middle class there was the growth of uh, many many other institutions the capitalists also uh, broke down into many many other uh, you know the ownership also broke down the capitalists also broke down because they were not able to sustain with whatever means they have the development of industry so whatever marx predicted of course uh, never happened in the way in which he talked about but marx is very very important because he was the first one who said that uh that the economic aspect governs all other aspects so one way of understanding the society and the social relationships and you know is to understand it from the economic point of view and of course he led many people to do more research to more understand the society and therefore we have many other sociologists who debated and who are today referred to as marxist who actually follow his ideology and follow the way in which he has understood and tried understanding the society so therefore it becomes very important for the student of sociology to focus on understanding karl marx around the same time weber max weber who came forward and he is referred to as one of the very very important founding fathers of sociology mainly because he talked about the relationship between individual and society and he was the one who actually gave the subject matter of sociology and where he said that sociology is the study of social action weber is also very very important because he modified the marxian theories he tried debating with marxian theories and he also expanded certain concepts which marx introduced but in you know uh, in sort of focusing on all that i'll just simply focus because the topic is the development of sociology as a scientific discipline and the relevance of sociology in contemporary times i will just focus upon the way in which max weber defined sociology and he said the sociology is study of social action and he says one way of understanding the society is to see the way in which the individual makes sense or defines his action so what is important is the interpretation which an actor attaches to his action so how do we understand the society we understand the society by saying that all individuals in the society perform an action and the meaning which us which these uh, people this individuals attach to their action say for example if i 
interact with someone? Why am I interacting the way I'm interacting? I'm nodding my head. Why am I nodding my head? To just to make, uh, make everybody aware or make them understand that, yes, I've understood what they are saying. Or I would say not by, by saying that I agree with what they're saying. So what becomes important is the, the meaning which I attach to my action. So one way of understanding uh, you know, uh, society very scientifically and systematically is to attach, to understand it as the fact that there is a method to understand and the method is that you attach a meaning to your action. The other methodology which you developed to understand the society was an ideal type, the a tool where he said that ideal type. And what is ideal type? Ideal type is, uh, you know, explaining, understanding or explaining reality in an extreme form. That is, you have, uh, you know, you have something which is in like extreme. Life. Say, for example, who is a good student? Who is an ideal student? An ideal student is one A who attends all classes regularly, who is very attentive in the class, who responds to the teacher, who submits assignments on time, and who is always very punctual and regular. In reality, it is not possible for an individual to be all this, but all may not be. But how close are we to this? And then depending upon that, we can say is a good student, bad student, or an average student. So there are certain kind of aspects. That is, you explain reality in an extreme form. That is, you define everything. Say, uh, what, do, what is the role of an economic institutions? You have multiple roles you list down. And then you say that how close you are to the reality, how close you are to that. And then you say that, yes, this is what it is. So he developed a methodological tool called ideal type that is explaining and expanding the reality to an extreme and see how close it is. So Max Weber is, of course, very, very important, A, because he reflected. He was also, of course, concerned about capitalism, the growth of capitalism. And also he talked about the various concepts which Marx introduced and elaborated or you can say modified them. And the other thing is that he developed very is referred to as a founding father, mainly because he developed a subject matter of sociology where he said this is a sociological study of social action. And action is uh, becomes social when an individual is enacting, attaches a meaning to his action. And he talked about three types of action. That is, and he said that all types of actions which an individual do or attach a meaning fall under these three. Traditional action, rational action, and charismatic. That is, you do an action because it is a tradition, a part of you. You always calculate, why am I doing this? What is What am I going to gain out of it? What is the value attached to this action? So you rationally calculate it. Or charismatic, that is, you are got that kind of, somebody has a charisma or you have a charisma and you feel that it's, it's important for you to act in a particular or have a particular say in this. So this is how Weber tries to understand society and teaches us how to look at the society and what is the subject matter of sociology. Now, or in the same time, in France, uh, in France, there was Emile Durkheim, who also, uh, France at the same time was experienced the impact of industrial revolution was uh, uh, you know having the impact of industrial revolution there were many many changes which were beginning to be seen there and uh, beginning to be seen there there were a lot of changes happening as i mentioned about the french revolution about the impact of industrial revolution which was leading to urbanism urbanization lot of changes so around and and at the same time an economist called adam smith came up with a book called wealth of nations where he talked about the division of labor, where he said that one way of increasing the efficiency, the production, and the wealth of nation is by dividing the labor, division of labor. And Durkheim adopted that and applied to understand the society and the social reality, where he said, where he basically tries to look at society. And he says one way of understanding the society is to see how order 
can be maintained and what are the causes of disorder. In other words, you also talked about the unity, the regularity, and its impact on life and expression. And these were very closely related to the concept of division of labor. That is, uh, how do we try to develop a mutual interaction, a mutual expressions, so that there is order maintained in the society. And if there is no solidarity, there is no consensus, there is no cohesion, then there will be disorder. So therefore, from the concept of wealth of nations in the economic terms, he adopted or he borrowed that and under, tried understanding the society in that way. And it is here that his most important work called Division of Labor emerges, where he also talks about the fact that one way to understand uh, the relationship between individual and society is to say that society is sui generis. That is, society has got a reality of its own. Society has got its own truth, reality, aspects. And we individuals are just atoms. We are a part. We do something because we are a part of a society. You know, it's very important for us as a student of sociology to also understand the difference between Weber and Durkheim here in order to understand more clearly that how sociology emerged as a very, very systematic science. Uh, like say, for example, there is an institution of marriage. Durkheim says that society may, there is an understanding, just for example, in Indian society, there is an understanding, there is a consensus that by the age of 24, a girl should get married. So all parents, the moment a girl is about 24, start getting worried about the fact that why she's not getting married. Why? Because it's a reality to say that uh, there is an institution of marriage and the girl's age is 24. I'm just giving an example. So what is important is that if we have to be a part of the society, then we say that, yes, she should get married between the age of 24 to 25. Otherwise, people start asking, what is wrong with your daughter? why your daughter is not getting married. So there is a lot of social pressure. So we do things because there is a reality. Society defines certain rules. Weber, on the other hand, says that the institution of marriage, which says that the 24th that the girl should get married, the individual is a part of a society, will say that I want to get married at the age of 24, mainly because I feel this is the right time for me to enter into the second phase of my life I'm here now ready to take the responsibility. I understand what is the responsibility. So that's how Weber says that society, uh, you know, develops, develops or understands, or that is the way in which we must understand the social reality. That is the meaning which a actor attaches to his action. Whereas Durkheim says society is there, individual desires, individual aspirations are not important. What is important is the fact that there is a society and we are a part of it. And if we are able to do as per the society, there will be order. And if they, we don't do it, then there will be disorder. Now, this aspect applies to us today also. Why? Because as society is becoming more and more complex, there are so many you know, choices, so many uh, divisions and so many need so much need for specialization that is there is because of that need of specialization there is a mutual dependence interdependency there is a mutual interdependence because we all want specialized things as simple as that a t-shirt why a particular t-shirt becomes more attractive than another say for a for example there is a black t-shirt then, you know, everybody likes black t-shirts. But then the one black t-shirt will stand apart from the other if there is a small red or maybe a green or maybe a white stripe to it. So that kind of specialization is required. I'll explain it in a different way. Uh, let's go back a little uh, forward to what Durkheim, I mean, explanation of Durkheim, where he says that what is important is collective consciousness. In order to maintain stability, in order to maintain equilibrium, because what is important is that how, because what is important is that there should be consensus, there should be equilibrium in the society. 
and how do you maintain that you maintain that by interdependency by collective consciousness in the simple societies like in very very primitive societies there is a mutual dependency why mainly because people cannot afford to be different you cannot afford to be different you have to be together i do it because my neighbor is doing it i am doing because my village does it i do it because i have to be a part of the kinship relations so there is a it's like a mechanical solidarity the solidarity the togetherness is like mechanical i do you do then only we can survive it's like mechanical it's like earthworm even if the back goes the, you know earthworm is very closely divided into equal parts even if you break the part it simply simply moves and then society is so much interdependent in the earthworm is so much like one all segments all parts are so much clearly defined that it doesn't matter so in simple societies you often must have observed also when you go to villages if you ask them what have you prepared they all say okay i have prepared you know dinner what is there for dinner there is one vegetable then somebody says i prepared say maybe all potatoes then then people emerge yes i also prepared potatoes because they don't want to be different they cannot afford to be singled out as society becomes more and more complex when i say complex means society becoming uh, you know more and more different in terms of scale and density that is population and technology also increasing there the mutual dependency comes because of specialization extreme specialization extreme specialization because there what happens is that it is becomes essential that there has to be something which i don't have and therefore i am dependent on others to learn to be a part of it social media like for example the social media why we are a part of all this because today we are in information age we want we have an edge over the others because we have information so the more in and how do we keep collecting information so that we are always constantly trying to be better than the other so therefore there is a mutual dependency i depend on you you depend on me there is a digital media then there is you know different types of medias different ways of connecting with one another different ways of understanding each other so extreme specialization need for extreme specialization also leads to interdependency that is the uh, the mutual understanding and you know so there is a solidarity it's like organic solidarity each part specializes and is dependent on the other part so uh, these are the founding fathers which who laid the foundation to study the society and to take uh, the understanding of the way in which individuals are related to one another and related to the social reality step forward so these are the founding fathers uh, so i think uh, we touch very briefly upon the three founding fathers which was mentioned earlier so, so as i said the sociology is not born out of some essay all of a sudden it was very very systematically developed into a scientific discipline where it is theoretical many many concepts were defined many theories emerged and there are different perspectives to study society and among the major perspectives we have uh, positives that is positivism which is talks about rationality functionalism which says please understand what role each institution performs what is the function what role does any aspect of the society perform that is the perspective of functionalism which says that society one of the most important thing is to understand society by understanding what role does a particular institution perform say for example social institutions social institutions may there is family what role does the family perform we go deeper into the role of the family suppose if it's not able to perform then what happens how individual gets affected then you find the ways in which you try to uh, you know develop or devise theories you know at understanding and analysis about the impact of a broken marriage a broken family an individual who's cut away from the family so what role does the family perform what happens if the individual is if you know cuts away himself from the family so these kind of uh, concepts theories perspectives emerge 
as I said, functionalist, which tries to understand the role, the function, which the various institutions perform. Then another very important perspective is the complete perspective, which means, which, which one of the assumption is that change happens whenever there is a clash. And this clash, this conflict is not negative. It is got, it is both positive and negative. It has got a very positive aspect. Like for example, elections. Because there are elections, that the parties who fight, each party tries to be, you know, coming up with the new things because there are always the threat of them not winning the elections. So whenever there is a conflict, there are uh, positive implications as well, not just negative. So, and then there are structural, that is what is very, very important is to understand how various institutions have the structures and within that structure, how they perform. As I said in the beginning, sociology is a very, very vast subject. The more, you know, uh, the more changes take place in the society, more subject matter of sociology emerges. So I'll stop here. And then uh, if there are any questions, I would like to take those questions. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Sumarika, Professor Rajalakshmi Midangaru, Benimshala, Samayam Patu, Prateka, Diana, Yunga, Samajka Sasra, Pizudala, and Twenty Amsham, Vida, Chara Lothain at Twenty, Adiana, Islish in Charu, Mukenga, Samajka Sasra, and Twenty, the Sangika Sasra Lokuka, Matruka, which mother Twenty and Eight Twenty Vishani Chapune, eighteen thirty Tarata, Samajka Sasra Ku, Samajka Sasra, with the Tundu, Sociology, Parsham Kupanto, Patu, Manu, Yukasan, Lopala. Mission and it went to the play the Paramamendo, Upper Mundi, Yoka Samajika Sasatam, and it went to the Paramamendanadi, father of sociology, August to come to Guchi Shapune, Spencer Sigani, Atlai Kaur Maxugani, Tarata, Max Weber Guchi, Samanshat twenty, and Ekaman at twenty, Vishalu, Professor Rajal Kimidangaru, Chalas Pastanga Japeru, Varkima, Telangana, Janavet Katapuna, Patekaman at twenty, Danyavadal, Madam, Epri Yavarana, Mitru, Yamana Prasnagani, Yamana Dowsigani, Ute. Uh, Madam no Adalu, please uh, hand uh, raise your hands, please. You are on a personal gani, doubts can you tell Madam not, please. Huh? Okay. Ram Garu, trust. Yeah, please. Venkatram Nagar. Yeah. Venkatram Nagar. please. Venkatram Nagar, unmute you. Well, type just the word parallel then. Okay, question in the noun. Okay, 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 okay. Venkatramana. Kindly unmute, mute, unmute. Yeah, Venkatramana, please. Very good evening, madam, and good evening, friends. Uh, your lecture has uh, raised some doubts in me uh, with regard to the very scope of sociology by itself. In fact, sociology as a social science discipline is a very dynamic discipline. Uh, it defines society as a complex network of relations bound by certain norms, some acceptable norms. And uh, all along your 50 minutes lecture, has only defined sociology and uh, you could have thrown some light on the dynamic nature of society. In fact, uh, the society itself is uh, impacted by culture and technology. So you have been telling about the economic determinism of Karl Marx, Marx Weber, and uh, you are not sufficiently throwing light on culture, the role of culture, how society has an impact on how culture has an impact on society. This is one thing. Secondly, 
as you have uh, rightly pointed out Durkheim's uh, analysis of uh, stability, order, equilibrium, collective consciousness, and other things. Does individual impact the society or is society impact the individual? Impact society. So individual has three types of uh, nature. Submissive nature, adoptive nature, and protective, uh, protest nature. He protests against certain social norms. That leads to social movements. When, in, when people do not want the order, disorder is uh, quite natural, and that may lead to social movements. And uh, is there any philosopher, sociological philosophers who explained about uh, the causes for social movements? Yes. Uh, yeah, there are, there are many sociologists who have talked about the uh, social movements. There is a sociology of social movements, a paper which has been taught to the young people about the social movements. Where, we, uh, where they are taught about the tribal movements, the women movements, the uh, forest movements, etc., and how it has impacted the livelihood of the people around them. Uh, now, before you had asked two questions. First, of course, I'll go to the next one, which you said about the fact that uh, um, there are two ways. You know, what is the relationship? Yes, there is a two-way relationship between individual and society. As I said, Durkheim and Weber. Is it either you look at the society from the social point of view or from the individual's point of view, which actually amounts to almost like a reciprocal relationship? That is, we are all part of us. We are atoms who are a part of society. Society is there because we are there. Say, for example, as I said, the society is made up of you and me. You and me are there because there is some reality around us. There is a relationship between you and me. Similarly, I cannot survive alone without you, or you cannot survive alone without me. At the same time, society is formed by us. So atoms and molecules, wider coverage. That's the way in which we talk about it. The other very important thing is that we have not known, it's not very clear whether egg came first or the hen came first. Egg or hen. If we say that egg came, then where was the hen? If the hen was there, then, you know, egg. So it's like hen and egg, which came first and who came first, who is more important, what is, how do we look at it? So it's like that. So individual and society. It's a two-way relationship. That's one. Two, oh, yeah. yes, culture again plays a very important role. There are changes in the culture. And in the beginning itself, I said very clearly that sociology has got two aspects, the dynamic and the static aspect. That is Everything changes. What is today will not be the same as tomorrow. And what is tomorrow will not be day, day as day after. Society, culture changes. Now, I'll give you a very uh, brief, uh, a quick example of the family system. Earlier, there was joint family. Why? Mainly because economic needs, uh, livelihood was limited. Agriculture was the main means of livelihood. Or they all, like it was not very... Uh, you know, easy to find jobs. So people will all stay together, work together, eat together and survive together. They would, you know, help each other. Then a stage came where there was economic rise. Uh, people shifted from joint family to nuclear family. Why? Because people started migrating, started going towards where the work was. There was a diversification in every aspect. Again, if we see in urban areas, there is a joint family. But this joint family is not the same way as it was the previous. Now the joint family is mainly because of the fact that there is a price rise. Economic conditions have really shooted up. It's become very difficult for individual family to take care of each other. Or, or for that matter, today, uh, today we depend upon grandparents for protection of the younger ones because there is crime all over or it could be that you know they, you know you feel that the softer nature of the children will come forward if their grandparents are around. So the reason for the joint family now is very different. So we have moved from joint nuclear joint changes. As I said, that the way in which one, now one has started reacting to the information age is very different from what it was earlier. So. Cultural changes, of course, are massive. As I said, that in one hour's time, it is very, very difficult to talk about sociology as a subject. 
because gender is a very important component political sociology is a very important component religious aspects religious institutions are very very important part of sociology so it has an impact and it has a subject matter which is related to all institutions not just economic institutions thank you thank you sir thank you madam uh, professor sudhakar sir thank you thank you very much for giving an opportunity <clears throat> At the outset, I congratulate the Professor Rajesh Mugaru for an excellent and more academic exposure on uh, the development of sociology as a discipline. Of course, it's the fact that by this time, uh, the sociology has already developed as an independent discipline connected with many other things. And my doubt and continuation and expectation from Professor Rajesh Mugaru is that uh, one uh, Mr. Venkatraman was asking about uh, What are relating to the factors of social change? Now, what I think is that the development of uh, social as a discipline sir, as one, one minute. Venkat Ramana is a professor in political science. Sir. Okay, okay. And he has actually uh, rightly pointed out an issue which requires to be more clarification from Professor Rajneshwar. In fact, uh, yes, madam, we have been talking about uh, the emergence of uh, social as a discipline, uh, taking into that term. And uh, where we are, uh, uh, Max Weber and Marx, and also I think uh, I love uh, here and there you also write about McKeever and Page, and I was also reading Fukushima as well. So far as any part is concerned, on the emergence of social as any part. So, ma'am, I'm basically I'm a teacher who teaches the political uh, law, and wherein I also teach incidentally law and social change in India and more uh, modern India. Probably you know about. Uh, The work that has been carried out by Professor M. N. Sinwas and Yogendra Singh, who have effectively demonstrated the factors of social change, and which are more and more relevant, would you kind of highlight to this audience as to what are the various factors, more particularly in, in modern India, which are influencing in a kind of social change, and probably what would be the kind of social change in emerging post 21st century area? Thank you, Madam. Thank you very much. See, uh, I would say all aspects, all aspects, all institutions, political, cultural, social, economic, all factors are education, technology, all are leading to changes in the society. All are leading to changes in the society. You know. Uh, if you look at the way the technology has emerged and entered into our life it has brought about a lot of stress among the young people uh, the way the you know the politics is being played the caste the social institutions everything so when we talk about factors of social change there are many many factors economic social cultural educational inst you know all factors play a very important role in bringing about change in the society change in the way in which individuals tend to relate to one another as i keep as i mentioned earlier also i'm mentioning again is the fact that covid the the kind of relationship changes it has brought about the kind of uh, it has brought about changes in the education system the kind of uh, you know uh, the violence which has brought about in the society it is also it, these are also factors of social change so all aspects bring about tremendous changes in the society so to just pinpoint one factor is very difficult yeah you know, i i fully agree and generally we say we teach that we start the beginning that uh, one cannot dip in the same river twice but if you go on attempting to dip in the same pond till you die you will be dip, you will be dipping in the same so that is how yes. the society will change it whether you are a party for it or you are contributory for it the society as its own will be changing yes get through but uh, what are, what our audience probably expecting is as to what are the factors important factors such as as highlighted by professor mn sirwas that is the cultural factor and social change that has occurred in purks in my mysore and uh, any other citation madam i think if you are very much conversant with andhra pradesh and telangana Which identical factors have influenced in kind of social change in Telugu-speaking areas? Would you kindly suggest so that I can do some more work on it for the benefit of my students? Thank you. 
the Thank language, the language, the festivals, the way the festivals are celebrated, the way in which the language is being used now, uh, there is a clear difference. Uh, like earlier, it. there was not much of a difference. The food, the ethnic, see, so all ethnic identity, ethnic identity has played a very, very important role in trying to, uh, you know, ethnic identity has played a very important role in bringing about changes after the division of the state. So, you know, uh, as I said, it's very difficult to pinpoint it one. There has been a lot of people, I mean, what, what my study has shown and what my I've been studying is the impact of the division of the state and the changes which has brought about in the way in which people have started relating to one another in terms of economic aspects, political aspects, social aspects. It would really require a big debate and a lecture on this. Except that I would just say that all dimensions have changed. All aspects have changed. And both it has an impact, both positive and negative. Because when we study sociology, we always try to understand that everything has got two sides to it. One, the negative, the positive. A synthesis of negative and positive leading to a next stage. So, I mean, I, as I said, that, you know, uh, it would require one hour discussion on the the uh, changes, the social changes, a topic on social change and what are the factors of social change? What are the processes of social change? It would require almost a one hour lecture on this. But yes, as I said very clearly that it has brought about tremendous changes in all dimensions, political, economic, social and cultural. Yeah, madam. Yeah. Yes, yes, madam. Yeah. If time permits, uh, if you are free any of any Sundays, if you give yes, us time, yes, we'll have a series of these lectures, Madam, on sociology. Yes, sir. Sociology. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, sir, as I mentioned, I have another appointment. So yeah, can I... Yeah, yeah, yeah. sure, sure, ma'am. One second. Uh, Dr. Vakitrama is again having some doubt. Shall I definitely <laughs> take up some other Sunday? And okay. uh, I'll, I'll be able to join yeah, you yeah. on some other Sunday, sir, please. Yeah, sure. Oh. Conclude. So, thank you, madam. Thank you. Telangana, Janavedika. Yeah, madam, madam, please. Uh, yes, what sir. up, thank you, madam? Yeah. Uh, Telangana, yes, Janavedika. Zoom online meeting, which is the uh, keynote address, which is not 20, Professor Vasiraju, Rajya Lakshmi Garki, Telangana, Janavedika, Tarpana, after take a minute 20, Danyavadal, madam. Adivinga, Ilati Karakron, Lopal Kuna 20, Dr. Ramana Garki, Viru. Uh, political science uh, lecturer, government degree college, Hyderabad, and uh, Professor Sudhakar Garki, Professor Aile Garki, Kita Ramaragar, Kita Mitra Landariki Kuda, Peru Peruna, Danyava Dal Jeli, Yusku, Dina Tikarno, Inturdo Mugistuna, Madam, Vati Varamu, Mali Kalskunta, Mantelius Kundu, Andariki. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, sir. Thank, thank you, you so ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Madam. Yeah, she's already left, actually. Yeah. Thank you, Madam. Meeting with them, sir. Choudhury, sir. Yes, yes, can I speak? Yes, yes, please. <laughs> uh, thank you, Ramarao Garo. Actually, uh, I was uh, careful listening to the lecture delivered by Madam, but as uh, she has rightly said. Uh, within a limited uh, period, time period, it is very difficult to speak everything. But I, I will make some observations on this topic. Uh, early social scientists, they never uh, made a division among themselves. That I'm a political scientist, he's professor of law, he's a professor of sociology. So they wrote. They studied social behavior, employing different methodology. They were neither committed to this or that. For example, uh, Tocqueville or Karl Marx or Wilfredo Pareto or Gaetano Mosca or Herbert Spencer or even Max Weber. They never made it uh, in what it had compartmentalized. Then there was a tendency to specialize 
you know, even uh, sociologists, they say, I'm a social anthropologist. So among political science professors, they say, I'm a specialist in international relations. I'm an international political expert. I am an expert in political sociology. I'm a state politics expert like that. Then again, a time came after the Second World War and especially after uh, 1920, when the behavior revolution took place, the Chicago school in America took the leadership. You know, they uh, made uh, uh, emphasis on interdisciplinary approach. So if you want to study a particular thing in the society, you take a team from the economic point of view, from political point of view, from sociological point of view, like that. Then uh, from the anthropological point of view, as Madam said, uh, sociology uh, uh, is a study of society and uh, we give August Comte the credit of being the father of sociology. But I'm interested as a political science professor to speak few words on political sociology. A, a particular branch has uh, uh, emerged. We studied politics from sociological point of view or studied social society from political point of view. For example, there are many scholars who wrote uh, the basic of basic sociological theory. Uh, I have given some names like Weber, but Robert Mitchells, Emile Durkheim, these names also were discussed. So they studied economic behavior, they studied political life, they studied family life, they studied social stratification and so on. They were inclined to see other social sciences in a way to derive something from the other subject. Most of them, they derived from sociology. Then uh, you find, for example, the structural functional analysis. This is one of the very important uh, developments in political science as well as political sociology. So we studied political system, political structures, political role, political culture, political socialization, et cetera. So coming to my analysis, let me say that in case of uh, uh, political uh, sociology, we have taken up studies. My guru and myself, we have also published a good book on political sociology that was published by Vikas uh, uh, publishing house. Uh, this is the book. And that was very widely acclaimed. Now it is out of print. So while studying this subject, we um, uh, covered, uh, for example, topics like social certification, political socialization, political culture, political modernization, modernization versus uh, tradition, political culture, political development, leadership, uh, particularly when leadership is referred, we refer to Max Weber, who talks about charismatic leadership. In India, now we are analyzing political phenomena, how a particular leader is charismatic, like either Pandit Jawala Nehru or Indira Gandhi, and now Modi is uh, capturing the votes because of the charisma. Even Gandhi was a charismatic leader of India, so charisma. Then political participation. When we study political participation, we take certain sociological concepts of studying why people do not participate. Or in other words, politics of non-participation. There is a talk in India now that we must make uh, voting compulsory. Every citizen must vote or there must be legal punishment. Now there are certain difficulties, constraints in implementing this. You know that, but this is, this is being debated. So concept like apathy, concept like alienation, concept like cynicism, concept like uh, enomy, which was uh, popularized by Durkheim. And you know, Durkheim was the sociologist who wrote a book on suicide. Why a man commits suicide? Even rich men commit suicide. Whereas poor people who are suffering, they don't commit suicide. And they say so suicide is a, a type of mental disease. And uh, under a particular circumstance, one commits suicide. Then the concept of power. Max Weber's definition of power is considered to be the 
best definition on power. When we political science people, we talk, we talk about state. State means politics. And politics is all about power. Who gets how and when. So he gives, he gives the definition of power saying power is the capacity of a person to do something in a community, community action, even against the wishes of power, wishes of others. That is the most standard definition of power. Then uh, uh, Professor Venkat Ramana was also referring to many other things like, for example, social change, social conflict. These are being discussed today widely. Why there is social conflict uh, in different parts of the world? Why there is violence? And what are the various uh, factors influencing social change? Then elitism, that is also being discussed. But before I uh, close, let me talk about, I agree with the professor who said that uh, the Indian sociologists should have to also to be emphasized. For example, M. N. Srinivas, a Mysorean Brahmin, you know, he was one of the very top socialists in India. Remember village, for example, or uh, his concepts like uh, Sanskritization. So he gave the concept of Sanskritization and defined Sanskritization, saying Sanskritization is a process whereby a lower caste tries to emulate the uh, tradition and culture of the higher caste, usual higher caste. And in his analysis, he has written that uh, of uh, Burakatha, Harikatha, or even uh, in the marriage ceremony, uh, some uh, uh, important uh, festivals, you find lower castes are imitating the style and behavior of the higher caste. And therefore, there is a process of Sanskritization. Three important uh, or four important uh, uh, concepts have been discussed in political sociology. One is political development. Second is politi political modernization or modernization as such, then westernization, then Sanskritization. Even Shamacharan Dube, S.C. Dube, another prominent socialist, he says he doesn't agree with uh, what is called um, uh, westernization. He prefers the word modernization. And what is modernization? Modernization, the meaning is, it comes from the word which means something new. You want to be modern means you introduce something new. So, Emmanuel Srinivas is famous for few basic concepts in Indian sociology, one is the concept of dominant caste. You, you know, in India, we talk about casteless society, we talk about Ambedkar's annihilation of caste, but caste is becoming relevant in India in every state. You have seen in politics of uh, every state, including Andhra Pradesh, undivided Andhra Pradesh, even in Odisha, Bengal, UP, Bihar, Rajasthan, everywhere now, caste is a very dominating um, um, factor. At one time when NTR was there, it was a fight between Kamas and Amma. That was the slogan. So like that, you find caste has become, you see the Tamil Nadu politics. So he talks about dominant caste. What is a dominant caste? A caste with a numerical strength. That is one. Second, a dominant caste also can be a dominant A caste can also be dominant caste if, though minority, it has got access to wealth and other uh, avenues or resources. So dominant caste. Third concept he popularized was vote bank or vote leader. You know, often you find in political discourses that caste is used as vote bank. Religion is used to create vote bank. So vote bank, all these words, dominant caste, vote bank, Sanskritization, they are all the contributions of uh, Professor M. N. Srinivas to Indian sociology. So now you find uh, there is a discussion, introduction to on tribe, tribe, for example. Uh, the, on tribes, anthropologists are studying, socialists are studying, political scientists are studying. So it is nobody's monopoly because there is interdisciplinary approach everywhere now. So tribe, class, and caste. Apart from these three social movements, like the tribal movement, the women movement, the youth movement, the student movement, 
all these movements they are being studied from different points of view so with these few observations it was a, a nice lecture uh, within the limited span available uh, with that i enjoyed the lecture program i profusely thank the telangana dana vedika for regularly arranging such discussions thank you thank you thank you so much sir thank you so much and uh, in fact i actually wanted to ask her a question but uh, unfortunately she had another program i wanted to ask her she was referring to uh, marx weber and saying that performing an action is also sociology a part of sociology then in the midst of the kurukshetra war sri krishna said about karma siddhanta you perform karma that is what if that is why you are here well, he was saying that so is it related to when we talk about sociology we can we take as sri krishna as also a sociologist similar to gandhi gandhi also led a social movement which ultimately uh, culminated in getting india's freedom so no, this is this is to be covered you yeah. so all the all the all the Though a particular discipline originates at a particular point of view, for example, uh, whatever we political science people do here, we borrow from America or some European. I will give you one example. There was a man called uh, F. G. Bailey, Frederick George Bailey. He was a social anthropologist. He has nothing to do with politics. He came all the way with funding and published three interesting books. the social and economic frontier in odisha then social change in odisha in 1959 then on the third book three books and uh, what was the uh, area of his study he came from uh, uh, a foreign country stayed in odisha there is a district called kondamal it is inhabited by kondas earlier it was called fulbani now we call it kondamals it was a very Four districts, so we called it thirteen among the thirteen districts earlier. Now we have thirty districts. So he came to Kondamal district, stayed here, interviewed most of the members of the assembly there, and if you go through his book, you will find politics, caste, social stratification, then you are freedom movement, then you are Gorjat movement, everything in that book. But he is a social anthropologist. so my point of view is it is it has all come to an interesting approach now for example somebody will study telangana movement after 50 years so he has to study from different points of view Correct. is there any caste uh, uh, factor in that or is there any factor for power sharing there is there a factor of uh, i mean uh, uh, torture among telangana people like pandit nehru said to andhra people or telangana people you go for the marriage with andhra pradesh with a clause for divorce when the state reorganization commission came you know 1936 orissa became the first state on the basis of long base long base is an important component of society ours is the first state in india under the government of india act 1935 then you are a uh, uh, poti sramulu has uh, uh, gone to first and uh, you got uh, andhra pradesh in 53 With Karnool as its headquarters, then after the SRC you got the uh, Andhra Pradesh. But Nehru said you go for marriage with a clause for divorce, and that divorce came only in 2014, 56 to 2014 long years. So any any subject matter, whether political matter or social society societal matter or economic matter, there are so many factors which influence that. Right. Okay. Thank you, sir. thank you sir. thank you yeah uh i am we here by stop this now because uh, madam has left and uh, in fact professor vishnu choudhury sir has engaged us with his vast experience as a political scientist and 